calls for answers are growing louder. No concern whatsoever for the patient. Investigations by the coroner and the health authority. A recorded video of her last moments alive. As racism and prejudice contributed to the death. We are in action. We want to fight racism. So far as to say racism played a role. The nurses did something unacceptable. Staff made racist and callous comments. Strapped to a bed, pleading with them to help her. Nobody was hearing her. I don't understand why Native woman, we have to go through that. We sadly have had to endure for so many decades. The system folds on itself. That's the very definition of systemic racism. For me, a system, it's all the system. There isn't enough change. It's not happening fast enough. Say yourself, one day they're going to kill me. Today, we'll be discussing the case of Joyce Ashikwan. Joyce was an Indigenous woman and a mother. She had seven children and she was a frequent patient at the hospital. Joyce previously had complications with her heart and she was required to visit the hospital once a month because of this. In this case, Joyce went into the hospital with stomach pains and these pains should have hopefully been treatable with some standard treatment. However, quite literally the opposite happened because after just a few days of staying in the hospital, Joyce unfortunately ended up passing away. But the biggest twist of this case was that Joyce didn't just pass away because of her health conditions. Because something her care team didn't realize was that just before she passed away, Joyce filmed every single thing they said to her. And in this video, she captured some of the most disgusting comments I've seen a healthcare provider say to a patient. It's terrifying to think what would have happened had she not filmed that conversation. And what shocked me even more was the response she gotten after all this occurred because it was very evident how the premier of Quebec felt about the situation. And it seriously just shows the never ending unjust treatment of indigenous peoples in Canada. But just to introduce myself, if you don't know, my name is Petal Palm and on this channel I post anything medical mysteries and crime. If that is something that sounds interesting to you, please consider subscribing if you end up liking this video. All right, let's get into this case. Joyce Eshaquan was born on August 28, 1983 to parents Diane and Michael Eshaquan in Manawan, Quebec. Manawan is a First Nations reserve and is home to the Atikamek tribe with a population of approximately 2,000. And of this small population included 37-year-old Joyce Eshaquan. Joyce was a mother. She was married to a man named Carol Dubé, whom she had seven children with. And during the time of this case, the youngest one was only just a few months old. Her husband described her as being a loving mother. She absolutely adored her kids and she loved being a mom. Joyce was a religious person. She absolutely loved her community and was loved by her community and was just overall a dedicated person to the Atikamekw community of Quebec. She was described as somebody who just absolutely loved life. But on the other hand, Joyce was also somebody who was unfortunately no stranger to various health complications. She was known to have diabetes, she had an intolerance to acetaminophen, and she also had severe non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Non-ischemic cardiomyopathy is a generic term for a condition where one has decreased heart function that's not caused by heart attacks or blocked arteries of the heart. I'm not sure which type Joyce exactly had, but the most common causes of this include viral infection, drug reactions, inflammation, or autoimmune reactions, or infiltrative processes. And hers was so severe, it resulted in heart failure and an ejection fraction between 38 and 10%. For reference, your ejection fraction is the amount of blood that is pumped out of the heart with each heartbeat and a normal value should be at least 50% or higher. So she was definitely on the lower end, and because of this, this required regular monitoring throughout the years, and she had been going in and out of hospitals since 2014. So for six years, she would often find herself in the hospital, and throughout these years, Joyce would grow more and more wary about the staff at the hospital. At some point, she had to start going to the hospital every month, and this was really tough for her. Her cousin described that Joyce would often recount her experience during her stay and would express her concerns that the hospital staff weren't understanding of her, and she shared that she often felt uncomfortable with them. On the afternoon of Saturday, September 26, 2020, Joyce was not feeling good. She was having really bad epigastric pain, which is pain in the upper abdomen, just below the ribs. This pain was off and on, but it was a 10 out 
out of 10 stabbing pain and it lasted for over 24 hours. So eventually it got to the point where Joyce couldn't deal with this pain anymore and she was in contact with the paramedics. This was especially a big deal because in Manawan there was no hospital. So for her to be seen by a doctor, she had to travel 200 kilometers to get to the hospital. For those who go by miles, 200 kilometers is 124 miles. And this trip would take two and a half hours at the very least. Not only was it long, but the road from Manawan to the nearby city hospital was also described as being in not the most favorable condition to drive on. It was a logging road, so there was no pavement and it was very dangerous because a lot of large trucks would often drive on it. And because of this, with the combination of many indigenous peoples already having a general fear or having anxiety about seeking care, going to the nearby city hospital was kind of a last resort option for the people of the Atikamek community. Things had to be really bad before they decided, you know what, like I need to go to the hospital. But Joyce really needed to go because not only had she been feeling this 10 out of 10 pain since the afternoon before, but she also had been just feeling unwell for the past few weeks leading up to this. Just the month before in August, Joyce had gotten a gastroscopy. And this is a procedure that uses a thin tube with a camera to check the inside of one's throat, their food pipe, and their stomach. But even though this didn't seem to show anything significantly wrong, Joy still didn't feel well later that next month. She described feeling the stomach pain but also having heart palpitations, troubled breathing. She even had nausea and was vomiting after eating some meals. And because of this, she was eating and was hydrating very little throughout those couple weeks. So finally, after the two and a half hour drive from Manawan at about 11 p.m., they arrived at the hospital. And the hospital was called the Centre Hospitalier Regional de Lenadier which in English is called the Regional Hospital Center of Lanadie and is also known as Juliet Hospital located in St. Charles, Borame, Quebec. Once they got inside, she was checked into a room in the emergency department and she was greeted by the triage nurse who was going to run the initial assessment on her. This nurse noted all her symptoms and that she was having 10 out of 10 pain in her upper abdomen, that she was having palpitations, difficulty breathing, troubled eating and hydrating. And based on these symptoms of having pain in the upper abdomen, the care team wanted to check her for something called coronary syndrome. Coronary syndrome is a condition caused by reduction or a blockage of blood flow to the heart. And upper abdomen pain could be a symptom for this. So to rule this out, they ordered an electrocardiogram or an EKG and a cardiac enzyme test. Both of these test results came back normal. So the admission diagnosis was that she had epigastric pain with an unknown cause and that she had an exacerbated iron deficiency anemia since her hemoglobin dropped from 107 to 81 grams per liter just within that past month. Hemoglobin is a protein in your red blood cells that carry oxygen to all areas of your body. So a drop in this could indicate that one might be having blood loss. So the team put in a referral to the on-call gastroenterologist and when the gastroenterologist saw Joyce, they wanted to make sure that the anemia wasn't caused by something big like, you know, bleeding in the large intestine. So they said, hey, I think we should do a colonoscopy tomorrow just to make sure everything's all good. And so they had Joy stop an anticoagulant she was doing. They adjusted her dose of pain medications. They gave her a bowel preparation and they made sure to monitor her throughout this time. The next day on Sunday, September 27th, the gastroenterologist came to see Joyce again. And when they entered her room and began talking to her, she allegedly was showing signs of agitation. They mentioned that this could have possibly been due to her going through withdrawal from narcotics and cannabis, but they didn't find any real use of these substances, so they couldn't confirm that it might have been the cause of Joyce's symptoms. Joyce reportedly was prescribed morphine for a similar pain that she had in August 2019. And during this current stay, the team did give her morphine, but they also gave her acetaminophen, maxarin, and Ativan. As all of these combined together were hoped to help reduce her pain and nausea and just any symptoms that could have been associated with withdrawal since that's what they were thinking was causing this. 
So they actually ended up scheduling the colonoscopy for the next day. And because they now thought that these symptoms might have had something to do with a disorder related to drug use or withdrawal, they ended up contacting a local rehabilitation center called the Joliet Addiction Rehabilitation Center. And they requested if they could have a consultation for Joyce. But after this evaluation, they determined that none of Joyce's symptoms were related to withdrawal. And even though they didn't have a clear diagnosis for Joyce yet, the nursing staff were still viewing and referring to her as a patient of withdrawal during this time. Something a bit odd was that on this Sunday afternoon, the person who was mainly overseeing Joyce's care wasn't a nurse, but was instead a person called a candidate for the practice of nursing or a CPN. This CPN was fairly new. She wasn't a certified nurse yet, and she only had less than four months of experience. Throughout the day, Joyce was still feeling very bad and was complaining that she was in a lot of pain. So because of this, later that day at around 8 p.m., the gastroenterologist came back to see Joyce since she was expressing how much pain she was in, and apparently because the staff members were describing her as being very agitated. In fact, the agitation was so bad, they ended up having to restrain Joyce they actually placed restraints on her. They put a restraint on both of her wrists, her ankles, and one on her waist called a lap belt. So a total of five restraints were on Joyce. And the doctor was like, hey, like we just need to make sure we monitor her very closely for the time being. After about two hours had passed by at around 10, 10 p.m., Joyce was finally much calmer and they ended up taking the restraints off her. And fortunately, it seemed that overnight she did still remain relatively calm. However, Joyce was actually the furthest from calm that morning. She was in fact very anxious. So much so, in the early hours of that day, she ended up calling her sister-in-law Jemima Dubé, begging if she could come to the hospital and pick her up because she was feeling very scared, which isn't a shock at all because this was also the day where everything went wrong because it was only two hours later when Joyce's symptoms got much worse and this case took a very tragic turn. Sometime during the morning, Joyce ended up speaking with Dr. Jasmine Tran, who was a family medicine physician working in the emergency department that day and was overseeing Joyce's care. Joyce had asked Dr. Tran if it would be possible that she could get discharged sometime later that day. And this was described as a cordial conversation and Joyce seemed fine because Dr. Tran agreed that she could be discharged later that day. At around 7.40 a.m., she was even talking to another patient who was on a nearby bed. They ended up talking for quite a while and Joyce even allowed this patient to use her phone to contact her son's school. At around 9.53 a.m., Joyce was again showing signs of agitation and showing signs of general discomfort. She was in a lot of pain and she was not feeling good. So the staff gave her one milligram of Ativan to hopefully calm things down a little bit. But this didn't seem to work because she was still not feeling well. 20 minutes later, at about 10, 10 a.m., Joyce was shifting around trying to mitigate the pain and she actually ended up falling off of her bed, which some of the nursing staff initially described as intentional. There's a staff member that works at the hospital and they're called an orderly. And an orderly is somebody who doesn't have medical experience, but they help around with the nursing staff, they help the doctors, they just make sure, you know, rooms are clean, things are stocked up, and just that the whole room is maintained and stays proper. An orderly who just got off her break saw Joyce around this time and described that she was kneeling on her bed, banging her head against the wall and screaming. So she tried calming Joyce down and was trying to get eye contact from her, but nothing was working. So because of this, the staff contacted Dr. Tran and Dr. Tran prescribed a five milligram dose of a medication called haloperidol or Haldol, which is an antipsychotic often used to treat various disorders such as psychosis or schizophrenia. She wanted to use this to see if it could help Joyce calm down. And so they ended up moving her from her initial bed to a private room to separate her from other patients since there was a lot of commotion going on. 
At around 10.25 a.m., they administered the intramuscular dose of Haldol, and Dr. Chan said, look, if this doesn't work, we're going to have to use the physical restraints again. Now, just a few minutes later, sometime between 10.35 to 10.45 a.m., Joyce must have been feeling very concerned because it was at this point Joyce opened up her phone and went to Facebook to start a live stream, which she ended up recording for a total of 7 minutes and 12 seconds. It's honestly so good that she did because this case would have probably been presented much differently without this information had she not recorded this. Despite it being just 7 minutes and 12 seconds, this recording showed the reality of what Joyce must have been going through during her stay at this hospital. From my understanding, this video has been removed from online and I've only seen clips from news sources. Plus, it was in Canadian French, so I wouldn't be able to understand it anyway. But from Coroner Jehane Kamel's report, it described that Joyce was filming herself, which you could also see from the clips that are still out. In the video, Joyce was screaming and moaning in pain, and at some point she was moving around so much she ended up falling off of her bed. After she fell, the staff members picked her back up, placed her on the bed, and they readministered the IV that she had in. And they placed her in a forelimb restraint and put the lap belt on her. With all of this movement from being restrained, at some point, Joyce wasn't filming herself, but her phone was down and was still recording. During this video was when a very concerning conversation took place between two staff members. And this conversation was between a nurse named Paul Rupre and an orderly named Miriam LeBlanc. The coroner's report provided a translation from the Quebec police force, and in the English version of this report, some things look to be translated a bit strange, but for the most part, you'd get the gist of what it's saying. In the beginning of the video, Joyce was speaking at Tikamek to those who were viewing it on live, and she said to them, quote, it hurts me. Carol, come see me. They are overdosing me with drugs. Make it quick. A little over halfway into the recording, at 3 minutes and 59 seconds, Joyce must have fell off her bed at this point because the nurse said, we're going to leave her on the ground for a bit, A. Eh? And then at 4 minutes and 21 seconds, the nurse said, we'll look after you. I think you're having a hard time taking care of yourself right now, but we'll do it for you, okay? Now, she also said something like, ask tea of a thick tarbinosh. I looked up what tarbinosh was and it means fudge, so it's often used when people say something is blank as fudge. So I believe this meant they were calling her thick as fudge, but I could be wrong. Following this, referring to Joyce, the nurse said, this is better off dead. At 5 minutes and 25 seconds, Joyce started moaning very loudly, to which the nurse replied, are you done messing around? Are you done with that? Piss off. <laughs> Joyce then said, if you were in my shoes right now, and the nurse replied, hey, you're thick in the head. Then Joyce said, I don't like it when people tell me I'm being silly about it. To which the orderly responded, well, you made some bad choices, baby. What would your children think seeing you like this? To which Joyce replied, that's why I came yesterday. And the nurse responded, she's good at sleeping around more than anything else. Later saying, especially since it's us who pay for it. <laughs> At some point, the nurse called Joyce stupid as hell. I did it by some colleagues. And asked her, are you done acting stupid? Are you done? At six minutes and nine seconds, Joyce moaned very loudly in pain. And shortly after, the nurse realized that they were being recorded and said, her damn phone is there. And she picked up the phone to try deleting the video, which was to no luck because it was already saved as a live stream and people saw it. And some of these viewers included her brother, Stefan Eshaquan. As soon as he saw this, he immediately started searching around for a ride because he needed to get to the hospital to see his sister. Not too shortly after the video ended, they ordered for Joyce to be closely monitored because she was in the restraints, and they wanted this monitoring to be done by the CPN. 
However, this was the first time the CPN ever dealt with a patient in restraints. So she went up to the doctor and asked her like, hey, like I've never done this before. Is it okay if somebody else watches Joyce just to be safe? And the doctor told her like, yeah, that's fine. So the CPN went to the assistant head nurse and told her, hey, like I need some help watching Joyce. I have a lot of other patients. And the assistant head nurse just told her to go find an orderly herself to do that. And if not, to just figure it out. So the CPN was looking around for an orderly to monitor Joyce. But not only were a lot of staff members on their lunch break, but the hospital was also just really busy at this time. So she couldn't find anybody to closely monitor Joyce at all. And on top of this, she had several other patients who she was responsible for looking over, and many of them required close surveillance as well. It was said that she had nine patients that she was monitoring that day, and several of them required close monitoring. So she definitely had a lot of patients that she was watching, especially for somebody who wasn't a registered full nurse at that time. So the CPN was left to just periodically pass by looking through the room's window to check on Joyce. But with being unable to find someone to closely monitor her, a whole 40 minutes went by with Joyce alone in her room in restraints and her condition grew very bad. Around this time, Joyce's eldest daughter, 20-year-old Mary Wasiana, arrived at the hospital and she headed towards her room. But when she got inside, she quickly began to cry because all she saw was her mother in the five restraints and her eyes looked blank as if she was dead. About the same time, at around 11.35 a.m., the gastroenterologist resident came inside Joyce's room because like I mentioned earlier, Joyce had expressed her desire to go home before the colonoscopy they had scheduled. So the resident came to her room this morning to get a form signed refusing the procedure. But with the state Joyce was in at that very moment, the resident obviously said, okay, she can't sign the form right now. Maybe I should come back later. So the resident began getting ready to leave the room. But before they could leave, Joyce's daughter stop them because she wanted to know more. She wanted to find out what was going on with her mom. Why does she look like this? So she asked the resident like, hey, like what's going on? Is everything okay? But when the resident replied, all they said was, I'm not the attending, so my assessment is cursory. Essentially just saying like, ah, I'm just the resident. I can't say what's wrong. That's the attendant's job. I don't know. And the resident quickly scurried out of the room. It was at this moment, Joyce's daughter immediately started filming a live stream on Facebook. And from the video, it's very evident that Joyce was not doing well at all. Her breathing was irregular and she was unresponsive. And just one minute into the recording, the CPN quickly rushed into Joyce's room because when the resident left her room, they went up to the CPN and said to her that Joyce was acting out. And acting out is a term they often use to describe patients who pretend to be sleep to avoid questions. However, when she entered the room and looked at Joyce's condition, she knew she wasn't acting out. It was very clear that something was wrong. So the CPN started gently shaking Joyce's shoulder, you know, to try waking her up, but she got no response. And so she was like, okay, let me take her vitals to see what numbers we'll get. But Joyce's vitals were not looking good at all. Her pulse was recorded at 70 beats per minute and it felt very weak. At this point, the CPN knew she needed to get some assistance and fast. So the CPN said to Joyce's daughter, like, hey, like, I just need to make a quick call because we need to transfer Joyce to a resuscitation room. But when she went to ask for this transfer, they told her that she needed to wait because all of the rooms were full. So she came back into the room and tried taking another set of vitals. But again, Joyce's values were looking really bad. And she tried explaining to Joyce's daughter, Mary Wasiana, that the reason that Joyce was unresponsive could have been because of the medications that she had taken at the hospital. This video recording that Mary Wasiano was taking lasted about 10 minutes when it ended around 11.49 a.m. And when it did, the CPN was still working on calling the doctor over to get Joyce transferred to a resuscitation room. In the vitals taken during the recording, it was noted that at 11.45 a.m. that Joyce's blood pressure registered at 57 over 35. Her heart rate was 77 beats per minute and her oxygen saturation was 90%. For reference, a normal blood pressure should typically be around 120 over 80 and a normal oxygen typically would be between 95 to 100. Resting heart rate is 
typically between 60 to 100 beats per minute. Above 100 beats per minute would usually be something called tachycardia, which means a fast heartbeat. And below 60 beats per minute would usually be considered something called bradycardia, which means a slow heartbeat. These are just rough numbers though. Your resting heart rate is really just dependent on many things like your age or your overall health. So it could be completely normal for one to be below 60 or for one to be above 100. However, I'm not sure what Joyce's normal resting heart rate would have been. So 77 could have very well been considered on the lower end for her, especially because your heart rate typically increases whenever you're stressed or whenever you're in pain. So it being lower while she was already feeling how she was would have been concerning. During this time, the CPN continued to try calling the doctor over and a nurse went to the head of the department to request for Joyce to be transferred into a resuscitation room. And while this eventually was approved, there was a bit of a delay before getting Joyce in that room. Because not only were there increased cleaning protocols during the pandemic at that time, but when the CPN was calling the doctor over to get some assistance, she was not getting a response. She ended up calling the doctor several times, but had no success. And she even ended up going to the central intercom and started urgently requesting for the doctor to come, which was backed up in the hearing as several witnesses heard her calling for medical assistance on the microphone. Because of this, in addition to them saying that all the rooms were full, she decided to just go check the rooms herself. And she ended up finding that there was a bed available, though they still had to wait 10 minutes before this transfer happened. It was finally at around 11.56 a.m. when Joyce was able to be transferred into the resuscitation room. But when she was, her condition was looking very bad. Her breathing was extremely shallow. A normal range would typically be about 12 to 20 breaths per minute. She was only breathing six breaths per minute and she was completely unresponsive. By this point, the doctor was at her bedside and they made sure to remove all four of her limb restraints and her lap belt. And just two minutes at 11.50 a.m., Joyce's heartbeat flatlined and they started trying to resuscitate her, which they tried for almost an hour, but nothing seemed to work. And it was unfortunately at 12.44 p.m. when Joyce was declared dead by the doctor and she passed away at the age of 37. After her death, her family began making some startling observations. It was only after Joyce passed when her brother Stefan and his sister-in-law Jemima arrived at the hospital. When Stefan got there, they immediately told him Joyce passed away. When Jemima got there, she went inside and began trying to look for Joyce. But this was a difficult task because it seemed like nobody was trying to help her find Joyce's room. And it took quite a while before she was finally pointed to a waiting room for families and she went inside. In the room, she was met by a translator. And this translator described to her that the doctors tried resuscitating Joyce for 45 minutes, but they were out of luck and Joyce unfortunately passed away. When Jemima heard this news, she just had to exit the hospital and take a breather. And when she did get outside, she could not breathe and she bursted out in tears. The shock was so bad, she described she didn't even know she was crying. And finally, after some time in fresh air, she headed back inside the hospital and she wanted to go to Joyce's room. And it was in Joyce's room where her and Stefan would both make the same observations about Joyce. Because when both went into her room, the first thing they noticed was that Joyce was laying down in her bed. She had the restraints on her wrists and ankles and her waist and they said she had bruises. Stefan even took pictures of the bruises, which he later showed to the coroner during this investigation. It wasn't too long after this happened when Joyce's story sparked national and global outrage. Just that next day on September 29th, the nurse Paul was fired. And just two days later, on October 1st, the orderly Miriam was fired. Around this time, the premier of Quebec, Francois Legault, condemned the nurse for their behavior, saying the remarks were unacceptable and racist. And he said that thorough investigations would be put in place, one conducted by the regional health authorities and the other conducted by a forensic pathologist. And with these investigations, more information was found out about this case. In fact, more than 44 witnesses described the events that occurred during Joyce's stay. And the problem began long before she arrived at that hospital that Saturday evening on September 26th. 
Remember how I mentioned Joyce had a gastroscopy the month prior in August? Well, she had this gastroscopy done at the Juliet Hospital. And during that time of her stay, Joyce was too crying out and expressing that she was in pain. But instead of this being noted and acknowledged that she was not feeling well, the doctor's note said, quote, she is dissatisfied and has a tendency to manipulate. The staff members were convinced that Joyce was just somebody who was addicted to narcotics and that she was lying about how she was feeling. So all of her cries for help during this day weren't taken seriously. So when Joyce arrived back at that hospital the next month in September, staff members immediately labeled her as a narcotics addict and they viewed her as such throughout the entire stay. Despite there being no evidence of her having consumed any narcotics on her own around that time, the only narcotics that she was found to have used were the ones that were prescribed and administered to her during her admission to the hospital. And the amount given wasn't even enough to categorize her as being narcotics dependent. In fact, during her admission, they didn't even conduct a medical reconciliation or a med rec. And this is an assessment meant to evaluate all of the medications that a person was taking at that time. Despite not conducting a med rec, they still labeled her as somebody who was narcotics dependent and was just going through these withdrawals at the time. During the hearing, none of the doctors nor any of the staff members were able to provide any evidence indicating why they were labeling her as narcotics dependent. They had no clinical diagnosis, no physical proof, nothing. The only thing that could have possibly been presented were notes from her medical chart from a few years back. So they had no clinical proof to show for why they were calling her that. This was just an assumption that they came up with on their own. And the gastroenterologists admitted in the hearings that this honestly was just a bias that they had in their mind. In fact, the doctor who was overseeing her care never actually wrote a clear confirmed diagnosis for her. In the notes, the doctors often used question marks whenever they were posing an untested hypothesis. However, it seemed that in this case, the staff just jumped to conclusions without a hypothesis truly validated. Which was especially odd considering they had her evaluated by the Addiction Rehabilitation Center and they concluded that she wasn't going through withdrawal of any substances. While this was not documented well, in the report I was reading, it claimed that during her stay, Joyce allegedly had a conversation with another physician who was at the hospital. It was believed that this conversation occurred because Joyce felt uncomfortable with the medications that they were using to treat her. During her stay to manage her pain, Joyce was prescribed and administered morphine. But during the investigation, her family claimed that Joyce had an intolerance to morphine. And that during this conversation, Joyce told this doctor that she she was uncomfortable with being treated with morphine, especially because she had a heart condition which made it hard for her to handle the drug. And she felt as though healthcare providers were never helpful in resolving her pain and that they would rather just send her home with painkillers regardless if it worked or not. And this showed in the timeline of events that occurred the day before she passed away. In the early morning of September 27th at 2.17 a.m., the nurse noted that a quote, advised patient to calm down and wait for medication medication to take effect, agitated on stretcher, crying. But despite this note, the rest of the night was relatively calm. However, later in that day at 2.18 p.m., the nursing staff actually began asking Joyce about her substance use and consumption, and they took a note saying, quote, she uses pot three times a day, and Moore says she never had withdrawal symptoms, blames nausea again. Now, sometime during that day or the day before, Joyce had an electrocardiogram or an AKG conducted to assess the rhythm of her heart. And from this EKG, it showed that she had a normal sinus rhythm. However, just a few hours later at around 5 p.m., the nurse paged the gastroenterologist and the nurse wrote a note saying, quote, patient has had an episode of palpitations and wants to know if he can prescribe a drug for withdrawal. So her heart went from being at a normal rhythm to having palpitations, yet greater concern wasn't put towards this issue during that time of care, but it was to her having withdrawals. They did, however, administer some medications to her with hopes that they would help. But this clearly didn't help much because just two hours later at around 7.20 p.m., Joyce again was saying that she was having palpitations and that she wasn't feeling well. And she was so scared, she started telling them, quote, 
I don't want to die. 25 minutes later at 7 45 p.m Joyce got out of her bed but when she did she was feeling very dizzy and she ended up falling on the floor. So three staff members came over and helped her up yet none of this was written down as an incident report or an accident report. And none of the staff members did an assessment of her pain after this fall. Instead, they noted that Joyce was, quote, cooperating, but is very theatrical. In that next hour at 8.39, this was when they said Joyce was agitated and they initially placed her in the restraints and had an orderly at her bedside to monitor her before the restraints were removed at 10.10 10 p.m. It was between that time of her being restrained at 9.39 p.m. when they started the fluid intake protocol for her colonoscopy that they had planned for her. Now, while doing their assessment, the staff weighed Joyce and they found that she weighed 87.09 kilograms or 192 pounds. However, when they weighed her the next morning on September 28th, her weight registered at 92.2 kilograms or 203 pounds. That means she would have gained 5.2 kilograms or 11 pounds in the span of just a few hours. During the hearing, the doctor in charge of hospitalizations in the family medicine said that this wasn't the true weight change and that this error was due to a reference weight that they recorded the day before, which I guess means they must have actually not taken her weight the day before and that the true weight was the one that they recorded on the 28th. But regardless, it still would be a little strange if they were just using a reference weight and not actually getting the exact one. And on that same day, the gastroenterology resident came to see Joyce and at 8 45 a.m she also noted again that Joyce was narcotic dependent and when questioned about this she said that Joyce's husband Carol was the one who told her this despite the fact that the resident never even spoke to her husband at all. So essentially even up until the day of her passing the staff that was seeing her was still labeling her as narcotic dependent. Now, like I mentioned, on that morning, Joyce allegedly was agitated and restraints were placed on her again. But get this, during the hearing, the doctor in charge said that these restraints were placed on Joyce at her request and that she apparently asked them to place the restraints on her because supposedly whenever she's in withdrawal, she gets very agitated and starts screaming and doesn't feel like herself anymore. So it's interesting that they claimed she asked for this. I mean, I don't know. I feel especially when somebody is in a lot of pain, it would be extremely odd that they would want to be restrained on top of that, but that's what the doctor claimed happened. So just about an hour later at around 9.50 a.m., Joyce was apparently agitated and started screaming and moaning in pain, which staff again justified with her experiencing symptoms of withdrawal. And this was when Joyce again fell on the ground and staff thought that it might have been intentional, as many of the staff members thought that Joyce was just acting during this morning. They actually wrote a note saying, quote, she is theatrical. In fact, a witness initially described this fall as intentional, but it was only later on when they changed their mind and said, oh, actually it could have been accidental. Because the patient who was in the neighboring bed to Joyce said that she was a front row witness to how the staff members were treating her. And she said that they were just fully lacking humanity or just care for another person. When Joyce fell, they heard a staff member say she threw herself on the ground, you know. And around this time, Joyce was crying out like, I don't want to die. I'm scared. I'm going to die. Yet a nurse reportedly replied to her, quote, stop shouting. You're disturbing everyone here. We're not in a daycare center here. We don't manage babies. They had this prejudice that she was just this difficult patient and couldn't seem to fathom the fact that maybe she was actually in pain. And when people are in pain, how do they react? They might be agitated. They might be moaning. They might be screaming. They are trying to do things to cope with this pain, especially when they're in fear that they are dying. But for some reason, the staff viewed this as, oh, she's just trying to put on a show and just completely lacked empathy for this human being who's going through this traumatic event. And she was still shouting a few minutes later at around 10, 16 a.m. However, she was said to be somewhat calmer. And the staff texted the doctor to notify her about Joyce and the doctor apparently understood that the screams were due to agitation as opposed to her being in pain. So the staff members must have worded this to the doctor as if this was just a behavioral issue as opposed to a normal response of somebody being in excruciating pain. So this was when the doctor prescribed Joyce with the five milligram dose of Haldol to use as a chemical restraint and just said, hey, like if this doesn't work, we'll just have to put a physical restraint on her. But get this, 
the doctor prescribed this without actually seeing Joyce herself. So essentially, she just took the word of the staff members who were saying she was just acting out as opposed to actually assessing her and realizing, oh, maybe she is physically going through something and figuring out a way to help deal with that. After this, and just before they transferred Joyce to a new room, Joyce was looking very out of it. She was sitting up in her bed, her legs were crossed, and she was cradling herself. And as she was in this position, she was just repeatedly moving her head up and down, hitting the wall. At this point, she ended up asking them to pass her her cell phone and they gave it to her. But while she was what they described as calm because she wasn't screaming anymore, her demeanor was still very off and she seemed agitated. There was clearly something physically wrong with her and the staff was concerned that her behavior was a bit erratic and was worried that it would be scaring the other patients in the area. So this was when they decided to transfer Joyce into the private room and this was where they were going to administer her the Haldol injection. It was said that Joyce was actually relatively calm and cooperative with the staff. She even in fact helped adjust her clothes so she could get the Haldol injection administered. But something that was interesting was that Joyce's cousin was also a patient who was admitted into the hospital's emergency room and was under observation there at the same time. And while this was all going on, her cousin was hearing Joyce calling out for help and just repeatedly saying her husband Carol's name. So clearly during the transfer and after, Joyce was still feeling very anxious. And that's when she filmed that video with the nursing staff saying possibly some of the most disgusting comments one could say to a patient, especially one who was literally dying. So after Nurse Paul picked up the phone, she told one of the orderlies who was working in the area what just happened. And this orderly went to the manager to tell them about this. The manager was actually not initially concerned about the video. It was only after later that evening when she found out about the second video that Joyce's daughter filmed when she thought to actually look into it more. And this was not the first time a complaint from a staff member had been put in about the treatment of patients. A social worker had previously informed her about a time staff members were insulting Joyce as they were apparently calling her and a nurse even previously informed the head of the department about derogatory statements that were made to a family one time. There was a time a Syrian family was in the hospital and they needed an interpreter because they didn't speak much French. But apparently one of the staff members said something expressing that they did not want to quote, waste too much time with them as they are not from here. No sanctions or investigations came from these statements. Also, like I mentioned earlier, when they were trying to get Joyce transferred to a resuscitation room, there was a bit of trouble getting in contact with the doctor as it took several calls from the CPN before the doctor finally came. However, in the hearing, the doctor said that they actually did start moving towards the room as soon as they got that first call. The only thing is, the evidence showed that the doctor arrived slightly before or even at the same time as the transfer to the resuscitation room. But what it just seems like from reading was that there wasn't too much initial urgency when that first call occurred, and that it was really the initiative of the CPN who took force of getting this transfer conducted as she saw that Joyce was in critical condition, and she was aware that Joyce's chance of survival was diminishing with each minute they waited for this transfer to happen. Once they were in the room, they tried using all the methods they could to revive Joyce, but this was all unfortunately to no avail and Joyce was pronounced dead shortly after. You would maybe think, or at least hope, that this was where staff would start assessing what just happened and, you know, maybe feeling some type of empathy towards the family, but... After Joyce's death was confirmed, many of the witnesses at the hospital actually supposedly overheard some staff members say that they were so relieved that this happened because they now didn't have to deal with this patient being an inconvenience to them anymore. The witnesses said that they overheard the staff say things like, quote, Indian women like to complain about nothing, to get stuffed and have children, and it's us who pay for it. At last, she is dead. So now to talk about everything that was done completely wrong in this case, because it didn't just start with the video, it started long before Joyce even arrived at the hospital. Number one, 
The fact that Joyce arrived at the emergency room and the first thing staff did was label her as narcotics dependent was just foul. You can't just say somebody is going through withdrawals when you have no clinical diagnosis to back up that claim, especially when you're basing your treatment off of the statements. And especially considering the fact that the assessment that was conducted by the Joliet Addiction Rehabilitation Center showed that she was not dependent on narcotics. This assumption that they had truthfully just showed the clear racial bias and prejudice that they had towards indigenous peoples. I'm sure this could be true in other countries, but right now, speaking specifically about Canada, because indigenous peoples are often living in areas that lack resources and education and where there's poverty, they are at greater risk for developing a substance use disorder. And clearly shown in this case, with this greater risk comes with a greater number of people who stereotype indigenous people with these harmful categories that they're all drug dependent and that she has to be withdrawing on narcotics instead of seeing it as this is a human and that this human in front of me is clearly distressed and is in a lot of pain right now. What made this strange was that during the hearing, the nursing staff claimed that they actually had no racial bias in the assumptions they made about Joyce. One even argued that she would have said the same things to a woman on welfare with lots of children. So yeah, they didn't even want to use the argument you know what? I have these racial biases. They're most certainly wrong. I need to work on ways to not stereotype people anymore. Like saying this to anyone is wrong point blank, but your argument of not even having any racial bias just shows that you clearly just lack compassion for any human being, period then. They thought that this was just a good argument to say that saying this to somebody in general was okay. Number two, the hospital's use of restraints was also something that was also very questionable. On January 28th, 2019, the hospital adopted a policy on the exceptional application of control measures. This policy assessed when different methods, including restraints, seclusions, and chemical substances should be used on patients. And it said that these measures should only be considered as a last resort option when treating patients, and that whenever these methods are used, that they are recorded and documented in a form provided. Joyce was both physically restrained with the restraints and lapel, and she was also chemically restrained with Haldol. Yet, no alternative method to help her calm down without the use of these control methods was ever presented to her. And nobody even documented in the required form that these methods were used in the first place. Because Joyce was already uncomfortable with being in the hospital and because she felt safe being with members of her community, having somebody of the Atikamek community stay by her side would have been a great option in helping her stay calm. Which is wild because they in fact did have an indigenous liaison officer from the Atikamek community who worked at that hospital and her name was Barbara Flamond. Barbara was hired as a liaison officer and she'd been working at the hospital for two years after the job was vacant for the past 10 years. Yet the idea of cultural accompaniment was never something that crossed the minds of those caring for Joyce. They saw that she was feeling agitated and distressed and the first thing they said was, oh, let's just give her this how doll. And if that doesn't work, let's just restrain her. Instead of maybe the indigenous liaison officer would be someone who can help her feel calm. In fact, the report said that many employees of the hospital didn't even know there was an indigenous liaison officer who worked there. But of the employees who did know that, none of them even thought to get her to come to not only Joyce's room, but the hospital failed to integrate her to the space in general. Barbara didn't have her own office. She was never introduced to the staff. The most introduction she got was being shown the desk that she had to share with another employee on her first day and she was even barred from entering the emergency room at times. So for most days, she was really just left wandering through the hallways, and sometimes she even just worked from home, waiting for the hospital to call, requesting for her support. On that morning, just before Joyce passed away, Barbara had no idea that there was even an Atikamek woman in the hospital crying out in pain. It wasn't until Joyce's mother, Diane, frantically called Barbara and asked her 
her to go check on Joyce. So she immediately made her way to the hospital's emergency room to try getting to Joyce. But when she used her hospital card to get access to the emergency room, she was denied access. She had a full hospital card with her name, her ID, and it identified her as a liaison officer. But for some reason, her card didn't register as a real employee's card. So she found a staff member of the emergency department and tried talking to them to get a better understanding of what was going on. And she asked them like, hey, like I'm here to see Joyce. Can you please let me through? However, Despite her ID, the staff member working that day said that they didn't recognize her, so they didn't end up letting her through. And they told her, look, we don't have enough time to deal with this right now. You can't come in. And they ended the conversation right there. So she ended up sneaking into the emergency department through another door. But by the time she got inside and reached the nursing station, Joyce was already in critical condition. So Barbara was told to sit in the family waiting room where she was joined by Joyce's sister-in-law, Jemima. And that's when the doctor came out of the room and broke the news to them. Barbara could have quite possibly been the only person to help Joyce at least feel a sense of cultural safety in the hospital, but her role was severely underappreciated and she was deemed as not important despite the availability and the appropriate resources she had that could have helped Joyce. She was employed by the hospital, yet she was not allowed in the emergency room and it took her having to sneak inside just for her to get there. Her car didn't register her as a real employee and many employees didn't even know she existed. Almost as if the hospital just had her employed just for show, you know, for their conscience. She described that doctors would often assume that she was a family member of patients and would often ask her to leave the room whenever they were doing consultations. Nurses too didn't want her in the ER and would often tell her that visitors weren't allowed. And even though she would often stay even after these remarks, she was there yet none of her availability or resources were used to their full potential. If they not only knew that there was an indigenous liaison officer who was there and employed, but treated her like she was an employee of the hospital, Joyce's situation could have been rightfully seen in a cultural lens by somebody who was qualified to do so. And this could have helped the team in making the appropriate decisions when it came to the care of Joyce. Which brings me to number three. Not only did they not look at this alternative option, just the mere fact that they used the restraints and used the Haldol yet didn't properly monitor Joyce afterwards was also something that was very wrong. Usually whenever intramuscular injections occur at the hospital, special monitoring isn't required. However, Joyce had her heart condition. So her being given an injection of this antipsychotic drug on top of being physically restrained did require monitoring just to make sure she reacts just fine to it. Through the investigation, they found that many staff members weren't aware of the restraint protocols that they had in place at the hospital. So on October 9th, the head of the department ended up sending an email to everyone saying, quote, from now on, when you use a four-limb restraint, you must notify the NCA or nursing care assistant. A private service will be requested, and to the extent that it cannot be provided, the patient will have to be transferred to intensive care. Monitoring should be at least every 15 minutes if all four limbs are restrained. This was essentially a reiteration of the restraint protocols that they already had put in place that many staff members seemed to not know about and did not do for Joyce. And get this, not only was Joyce scarcely monitored after these restraints were placed, but the nurse who administered the Haldol injection to Joyce seemed to not worry about the possible complications to the point where she even left for her lunch break right after the injection. And with the CPN having such little clinical experience, it is possible that she wasn't fully able to understand the risks and complications that could have come with the little monitoring, especially considering she had many other patients to closely monitor as well. The nurse who administered the Haldol injection to Joyce, she had experience and she really should have been the one to know like, hey, we need to make sure we keep our eyes on her because we just gave her a chemical restraint, a physical restraint, and she has a history of heart issues. During the investigation, the CPN was really the only one who truly admitted to their error in keeping record of Joyce's condition at the time. Number four, although the toxicology report found that every medication Joyce was given was found in the therapeutic threshold, this includes acetaminophen, diphenhydramine, and morphine, 
Joy still had a lot of concern that morphine wouldn't have been good for her due to her history of heart issues. What maybe could have been done to at least make her feel less anxiety about being given morphine was look at any other options for pain medications they could have gave her. And if those didn't work, then you could have said, you know what, I'm sorry those didn't work. The only option we have now is morphine if you're comfortable with it and let her decide there. Number five, the resident claiming that Joyce was acting out and them leaving the room so quickly despite how Joyce was looking and how concerned her daughter was, was just foul. It was kind of clear the reason the resident actually left so quickly. And this was because they just genuinely did not want to be there. The report says that Joyce's family members had apparently told staff that they wanted the situation to be taken seriously because it seemed like time and time again, this was never the case with them. But because they said this, the resident supposedly felt like these comments were threats. So the resident was in Joyce's room and quickly went out because of this threat that they supposedly felt. What was odd though, was that despite all of this and despite seeing how Joyce was looking, the resident didn't end up calling the intending physician after this event. And when they were later questioned about these alleged threats, they were not forthcoming about it. Like these threats were apparently so bad that they had to leave the room early when it happened. But when questioned about it later on, they seemed to not have much comment on the situation. And all they wrote in their notes was that Joyce was quote, calm, attached to all four limbs and difficult to wake up. And this description of her being calm was weird because she wasn't calm, she was unresponsive. Later in the investigation, Dr. Aylan Vandenbonker, an emergency medicine physician at the Montreal Heart Institute, said that it was odd that the resident described Joyce as calm, saying, quote, coma and calm aren't the same. And number six, last but most certainly not least, the comments in the video recording. This is pretty self-explanatory. We went through these comments and they were disgusting. But what these comments showed was a continuous issue going on in Canada, which is the mistreatment of Indigenous peoples, especially in medical settings. There is just a horrible history of mistreatment and cultural genocide regarding Indigenous peoples in Canada. We can go back to when the Europeans started settling on the land and in the 18th century when they, alongside the Canadian government, began forcing assimilation on the Indigenous peoples. They started forcibly taking children out of their homes and forcing them into residential schools to try to make them forget about their culture and live up to these European Canadian standards. And if any of these rules were broken, these children would deal with such horrible punishments and abuse. There were 130 residential schools with over 150,000 children placed in them. Plus, these schools started in 1847 and only ended in 1996. So it wasn't even a long time ago when they were doing these horrible things to force Indigenous peoples to forget about their culture and to instead live in a way that they deemed as the Canadian way. But even after these schools ended and the government issued an apology and acts that were put in place to try fixing this issue. This didn't stop the terrible damage that was done on these communities and the issues they continue to face till this day. Just in May 2021, the remains of 215 children were discovered at the Kamloops Indian Residential School in British Columbia. This school closed down in 1978, but you can see how this is still a problem today considering how it was only two years ago when they discovered all of these children's bodies. And these consequences of colonialism continue to affect indigenous peoples as it shows in the things that their communities are more at risk to. This includes being victims of violence, unemployment, food insecurity, overcrowded housing, mental health problems, especially for youth, low levels of confidence in the justice system, and like in this story, systemic racism. Tendency to live in lower socioeconomic communities and lack of access to quality health care puts Indigenous peoples at greater risk of having lower health outcomes. But what also contributes to the risk of lower health outcomes is racism, including systemic racism, within the healthcare system. Following Joyce's death, the Quebec premier, Francois Legault, went on stand and said that there is an issue of racism in the province. However, he said that there is no systemic racism, that people may be racist, but there is no system that is inherently racist 
in the healthcare field. He also later claimed that the racism issue at the Joliet Hospital is all settled, which is definitely not the case. He later apologized to Joyce's husband Carol after receiving backlash for this comment, but he still maintains his statements that systemic racism doesn't exist in Quebec. And similarly, some witnesses heard from employees at the hospital that they claimed that their work environment was actually free of racism or derogatory comments. Despite the fact that in the past two years before Joyce passed away, there were 20 instances of racism towards the Tikamek people at the Joliet Hospital reported. And this was reported to the VN's Commission into the Treatment of Indigenous Peoples in Quebec's Public Services. So this case amongst these many other reports shows that this is just not true. The healthcare system was not set up in favor of Indigenous Peoples and it continues to show today with how they are often treated as if they don't belong in healthcare settings or as if they're a nuisance who should seek care elsewhere. The health disparities that Indigenous Peoples face is rooted in the long history of colonialism which introduced new diseases to them, took away their traditional medicinal practices, put them in places where they lack resources, and continued the growing myth that one's illnesses or health issues are at the fault of themselves. And due to these clear disadvantages and mistreatment, many Indigenous peoples feel as if they don't belong in healthcare settings. So while some staff members claimed that there was no racism in their work environment, many witnesses obviously said, no, there is racism in the hospital, and we've heard clear prejudices against the Atikamek community while here. I linked some really good sources in the description that go more into depth about the history of racism and healthcare disparities of Indigenous peoples, so I'd recommend checking those out. So now for the aftermath of this case. All witnesses and staff involved were investigated. These staff members who were caught on camera taunting Joyce lost their job really quickly, in fact. The first was Nurse Paul, who was fired on on September 29th, the day after Joyce passed away, and the second was Orderly Miriam, who was fired two days later on October 1st. And this story made global headlines. People were protesting, demanding justice for Joyce and for changes to be made in the treatment of Indigenous peoples, not only in the hospitals, but in the country. Some nurses who even worked at the hospital described being upset and devastated after seeing the video and hearing their colleagues saying the things that they said to Joyce. And you would hope most people would feel this way and recognize that there was a lot done wrong in this case. However, there were reports of people being very nasty to Joyce's family after this occurred. Her brother Stefan reported that following Joyce's death, his children were being bullied in school because of it. He said that kids at the school reportedly told one of his children, quote, they will kill you like they did your aunt. And Joyce's eldest daughter, Mary Wasiana, also reported receiving death threats after testifying. During the hearing, the orderly Miriam tried explaining her comments, and she said that her comments were coming from a good heart. On that day, when she walked into Joyce's room, she saw that Joyce was sitting on the bathroom floor, and she was either screaming or moaning in pain. She was the one in the video who said to Joyce, well, you made some bad choices, baby. What would your children think seeing you like this? Her defense was that she's been taught to try to invoke good reactions in patients. So essentially, everything she was saying to her was not meant to be taken in a condescending or rude way, but she was trying to motivate Joyce to get up and make her feel like she can change her life around, claiming that bringing up her children might, quote, bring her back to reality. And saying the only reason she said that Joyce made some bad choices was because a nurse had told her that Joyce was narcotics dependent, and she fully believed that this was true and that Joyce was going through withdrawal. Likewise, many staff members attributed some contributions to the behavior to being overworked, especially the staff working in the emergency department. It wasn't uncommon for staff members to skip out on breaks and lunches because there was always so much work to do with never the right amount of staff members. In fact, on August 12th, a little over a month before this case happened, an email written by a nurse was forwarded to the head of the department talking about the difficulties the staff had regarding their workload. In this email, the nurse described that the hospital was often so busy that the nurses didn't have enough time to adequately supervise the CPNs. And this showed with the fact that the person mainly overseeing Joyce's care was a CPN with nurses popping in whenever need be. The email continued with the nurse expressing concern that this lack of adequate staff puts the patient's health at risk. And they said that if they have to continue working in these conditions, 
they didn't want to continue their position there. Also, just the mere fact that they had a CPN doing the bulk of the care for Joyce was also something that was not okay because they had a nursing rule adopted in 2018 that stated, quote, CPNs are not authorized to practice in triage in the shock room and in the ambulatory section of the emergency department. It was only in 2019 when management decided to bring CPNs back to the emergency department, but it was said that they would do so as long as the CPNs had experienced nurses to rely on for training and support. But what was weird is that they still considered CPNs as nurses in their staff planning. So in reality, they only really brought them back to deal with these staff shortages that they were facing instead of just hiring true registered and experienced nurses, which of course puts patients' health at risk. And we see this in the case of Joyce. The CPN who was overseeing her had only just a bit under four months of experience, had yet to obtain her nursing permit, and at some point that morning had nine patients under her care with several of them being unstable. And when she was requesting help from the assistant head nurse in providing close monitoring to Joyce, the assistant head nurse told the CPN to find an orderly to do it herself, which she had no luck finding. So the CPN just had to do all this monitoring by herself, which would have been difficult for somebody who one, didn't have the experience with dealing with patients in this kind of situation, and two, had so many other patients that they were seeing that morning. On top of that, the assistant head nurse didn't even once visit Joyce to assess what was going on or to at least provide assistance to the CPN. While there's no doubt that nursing staff were overworked, especially during this time in 2020, I don't see how being overworked would correlate to you treating somebody like this. I don't think being overworked is an excuse to lack compassion, especially in the case of the video that was recorded with all these taunts and insults that were said to Joyce. This was an argument used by Nurse Paul. She burst into tears during her testimony, saying that in all her 33 years of experience, she's never lashed out on a patient like that. And when she listened back to the recording, she couldn't believe the things that she said. She described that on that day after Joyce fell on the floor, she was fed up thinking about all the paperwork she would have to do when filling out an incident report and that the stress of working in a hospital environment during the pandemic was, quote, the straw that broke the camel's back. And she described that she sees herself as a kind person and asked the family for forgiveness that she just lashed out on that day. She also said that Joyce's race had nothing to do with her reaction, saying, quote, I wasn't angry at her because she was an antigamic patient. I was angry at the situation, the workload, and the pressure. She pled guilty to verbal violence and negligence in treatment of a patient. And lawyers from both the prosecution and defense proposed a plea agreement suspending her right to practice for 18 months, with 12 being for the verbal violence and six being for the negligence. I'm unsure the status of all this right now, but from what I've last read and understand, it does seem that she is currently fired at the moment. In the end, the coroner's report ruled Joyce's death as accidental, saying in the autopsy that she passed away from pulmonary edema. To be exact, it said Mrs. Joyce Eshaquan died as a result of pulmonary edema caused by cardiogenic shock in the context of a diseased heart associated with possibly deleterious effect maneuvers such as the supine restraint without adequate supervision. However, the report also stated the racism and prejudice that Mrs. Echaquan faced was certainly a contributing factor to her death. In court, when coroner Jahane Kamal was asked if she still thinks Joyce would still be alive if she were white, she replied, I think so. The report also listed multiple things that could have reversed the clinical situation. This including increased monitoring, especially by an experienced nurse, a quicker transfer to the resuscitation room, better assessment by the doctor, early recognition of Joyce's conditions, early recognition of her signs and symptoms, a protocol for the early launch of a code blue, as well as a cardiac and oxygen saturation monitoring being installed. The report also called for the Quebec government to take the appropriate steps to change this by first to quote, acknowledge the existence of systemic racism within our institutions and commit to helping eliminate it along with a list of actions that the Regional Health Authority, which in English is called the Integrated Health and Social Services Center of Lonadie, or CISSS, should do. Joyce's mistreatment and death was definitely something that did not help in the patient-provider relationship. 
those of the Atikamekw community were left with even more mistrust in the healthcare system. And healthcare providers were left feeling nervous that their words might be misinterpreted by patients. So the hospital wanted to make some changes to try their best to mend this relationship. This involved implementing a mandatory training session. In fact, back in 2019, the hospital did have a training session available to employees, but only five out of their 200 employees showed up to these training sessions. A mere 3% rounded up went. The reason for this low turnout could be that one, maybe people didn't want to show up, but two, I'm not sure if they're doing this now, but at the time they were sending information to their employees through their personal email. So it's possible a lot of the employees just didn't even see these training sessions were taking place. After Joyce's death, the hospital implemented a mandatory three-hour training session for employees to hopefully avoid issues like this from happening again. But even though this was mandatory, this didn't really seem to do much because a lot of the employees claimed that they actually didn't really learn much from this training session and that nothing in particular was really helpful in improving their daily practice. From what I understand, it seemed almost as if the training just viewed racism as a single dimensional thing as opposed to a complex issue rooted in history. So if they really want to make changes, they should probably work on improving these training sessions and maybe making it something that would allow employees to truly dig deep and try their best to learn how to connect with and treat the Atikamekw community. Barbara, the liaison officer who was ignored when trying to reach Joyce in the hospital, was reported to be on medical leave in May 2021. And she said that she did not intend to go back to the hospital. So one of the next steps the hospital did is that they ended up hiring two more cultural safety liaison officers, with one of them being specifically a part of the Manawan community. And they were going to be hired as a 24-7 employee to be able to be there and provide support any time of the day and any day of the week. But with doing this, what they need to do is make sure that they hold themselves accountable to actually use the services offered by these employees. Like mentioned, this story not only sparked national, but sparked global outrage. Many were protesting to get justice for Joyce. There were lots of ceremonies, there were vigils, and people were wearing purple outside to honor Joyce as that was her favorite color. This led to something called Joyce's Principle. Joyce's Principle was launched by the Atikamekw Nation and it's aimed to ensure that all Indigenous peoples have the right and have equitable access to health and social services without having to face discrimination or having to risk their physical, mental, or emotional health. Stating, Joyce's Principle aims to guarantee to all Indigenous peoples the right of equitable access without any discrimination to all social and health services services, as well as the right to enjoy the best possible physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health. Joyce's principle requires the recognition and respect of Indigenous people's tradition and living knowledge in all aspects of health. With a statement from her husband Carol saying to quote, let her voice be the beginning of real change for all Indigenous peoples so no one ever again falls victim to systemic racism. Likewise, the Ministry of Health and Social Services, or MHSS, put a plan in place to vow $15 million towards implementing cultural safety practices in all healthcare settings by 2025. This involves a five action plan, including the implementation of continuous training, the accompaniment of the network establishments, the creation of liaison officer positions, services browsers, and the overhaul of the complaints review system. Though there is still a gap between healthcare accessibility and services for indigenous peoples of Canada. And this shows in the changes that are being done that kind of aren't that helpful. On June 9th, 2023, Ian Lefrenaire, who is the minister responsible for the relations with First Nations and Inuit, introduced Bill 32, which is said to be an act to implement the cultural safety approach within the health and social services network. This act is meant to ensure that history and culture of Indigenous peoples is taken into consideration when treating them. However, many criticized the bill, including Quebec's College of Physicians and Indigenous groups, as they argued that cultural safety in the health network isn't possible without first acknowledging the root issue of systemic racism. This is a big deal considering that the Quebec Premier and the Coalition Avenir Quebec government 
denies that systemic racism even exists. In fact, on September 12, 2023, the Department of Family Medicine at the University of McGill in Montreal, Quebec, became the first medical education department in Canada to adopt Joyce's principle. The government of Quebec still has yet to adopt it because of their beliefs that systemic racism doesn't exist. So Bill 32 is kind of like, if you're not even going to acknowledge that systemic racism exists, how are you going to try to fix the issues? As for those involved directly in this case, just a year before that, on September 29th, 2022, two years after Joyce's death, was when her family filed a $2.7 million civil suit. And this lawsuit was against the Regional Health Authority, or the CISSS, Paul Rocre, who was the nurse who was on video insulting Joyce, and Dr. Jasmine Tran, who was the doctor who was overseeing Joyce's care on that day. This lawsuit includes $2,155,000 from the CISSS and Dr. Tran, $20,000 from the nurse Paul, and an additional $500,000 in punitive damages from the CISSS. With their lawyer emphasizing that the CISSS knew about these issues Indigenous peoples faced well before Joyce was hospitalized, which is evident in the investigations conducted. Yet serious action wasn't taken until all of this occurred. It took Joyce losing her life before something truthfully was done. And this really only being because it was filmed and people got to witness the mistreatment that many people of the Atikamekw community Community we're going through at these hospitals and many treatment a lot of Indigenous peoples in Canada face. They say that this lawsuit isn't just for Joyce, but it's for all Indigenous peoples to hopefully create a safer space for them in the healthcare system. Joyce's husband, Carol, said that this should also hopefully make the necessary changes move faster and further as well. And a bit of a plot twist. On August 16th, 2023, Serge Brault, who is an arbitrator at Tribunal, ruled in favor of Miriam LeBlanc, the orderly who was captured on camera telling Joyce she made bad choices and asking what her children would think, saying that she should be reinstated. The arbitrator said that although Miriam's remarks were insulting and inappropriate, she wasn't responsible for the bulk of the mistreatment towards Joyce, saying, quote, the faulty conduct occurred on only one occasion in an emergency and acute crisis situation in over approximately five minutes, and that the orderly's actions couldn't be compared to the insulting, vulgar, racist, and rude remarks and behavior of the nurse who was captured on video. And while he acknowledged that she should have been sanctioned for the comments she made, he criticized the decision to fire her as he said that that was influenced by pressure from the public and media. Pretty much saying, yeah, what she said was inappropriate, but it was a small part of a larger issue of staff members who did or said much worse. As he brought up the point that in the video, Nurse Paul was the one saying the real derogatory things, suggesting things like Joyce would be better off dead. However, Miriam instead was the one saying things like, how would your children feel? In my opinion, I just think at the end of the day, regardless if what you said was worse or not, if you hear another staff member taunting and insulting and degrading a patient, it's your responsibility to either check that colleague or tell your boss about it. Obviously, I haven't seen the full video and I'm just basing this off of what's been described in the reports and news sources, but in none of the sources I've seen have any of the employees said, hey, that's inappropriate, don't say that. It's just the fact that it was filmed, we see what kind of behavior that some people were quite lenient towards. But essentially, they believed that yes, the comments were inappropriate, Yes, she lacked proper professional conduct. And yes, there should be some consequences for those actions, but there was no malicious intent. And Miriam has the potential to change her ways and it did not warrant the firing. The employer, which is the CISSS, said they were analyzing the decision, but they declined further comment. So I'm unsure about the status of her employment and I'm also unsure about the status of the lawsuit that Joyce's family filed. But at the end of the day, no amount of money could take away the trauma that not only Joyce went through, but what the family went through at the hands of the hospital staff. It is unfortunate that it took another person losing their life for more eyes to see this issue going on in Canada, especially since there are other stories similar to this involving the mistreatment of Indigenous peoples. This one just made it in the media because it was filmed. Systemic racism is a huge issue in the healthcare field, and step one of it being fixed is it being admitted that it is an issue and that more people stand firm behind it to ensure that this doesn't happen to anybody else. And Joyce's legacy will continue 
continue to live on as we continue to address these issues and start making necessary changes. But that is it for today's video. I definitely thought that this was an important issue to discuss. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments and make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any more stories of medical cases, crime, and mysteries. Bye now.